Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, as we head into the new year in the midst of our accelerating digital transformation, cybersecurity concerns remain one of the biggest threats to institutional economic prosperity. Fester Sakimbusoye, a British Conservative politician who was elected as Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner earlier this year, will be joining me from Morgan State, where he'll be sharing some advice on how businesses and policymakers can tackle this ever-evolving illicit trend. And with Africans holding the top jobs at several global institutions, should we be expecting a larger seat on the global stage in the coming year? Agnes Gitau, a London-based government and corporations consultant at GBS Africa, will be joining me for her assessment on the continent's international appeal. The later Chief Bimbo Roberts Falayan, the CEO of the Nigerian Diaspora Direct Investment Summit, will be joining me from London for an overview of the African investment space. But first, as always, let's start the show with business news from here in the UK, where reactions are mixed following the announcement that the government will not be introducing fresh COVID restrictions in England before the new year. Despite despite the record rises in reported cases. The Prime Minister met with England's Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty and his Chief Scientific Advisor Sir Patrick Vallance earlier in the week to discuss the latest data and the situation was not enough for the Conservative Party leader to inflict further measures in England. This is despite tougher restrictions in place across the devolved nations. The Prime Minister is urging Britons to remain cautious during New Year's celebrations while warning of the risks of hospitalisations for the unvaccinated. I cannot stress too much how vital it is for everybody to get that booster jab, particularly the 2.4 million people who've had two jabs but haven't yet had their booster. They had two jabs more than uh, six or seven months ago, so they're eligible for their booster, but they're not yet coming forward to get it. So I would say to people, come forward and get your, your booster. It's a fantastic thing to do. It makes a huge amount of difference to, to you. It protects you. And I'm sorry to say this, but the overwhelming majority of people who are currently ending up in intensive care in our hospitals are people who are not boosted. I, I've talked to doctors who say the numbers are running up to, to 90% of people in intensive care who are not boosted. If you're not vaccinated, you're eight times more likely uh, to get into hospital altogether. So it's a great thing to do. Uh, it's very, very important. Get boosted uh, for yourself and, and enjoy New Year sensibly and cautiously. Earlier I spoke with our business correspondent Simon Pusey for some analysis. Simon, so no new restrictions in England uh, before the New Year. Mixed reactions, I expect. Yeah, a lot of confusion um, across the world, really, because um, England's coronavirus cases have never been higher. 117,000 at the moment. Every day there's a new record, um, and yet the government aren't putting in even small restrictions. You know, a couple of weeks ago they said, try to work from home if you can, wear masks in public places, but other than that, they haven't really done anything, and I think a lot of people are confused as to why. I think a lot of sceptics would say this is more um, political um, and for the Conservative Party to appease their backbenches than it is scientific, and I think a lot of scientists and people on the stage board might be quite annoyed with Boris Johnson and the government for not doing anything, really. Um, let's just go through quickly. No current plans to um, change anything before next year. A lot of people thinking that maybe after Christmas and New Year they will start to put on restrictions because obviously it's a little bit easier to do that in January when people don't necessarily want to go to social situations as much as they might do in December. Um, uh, one thing that the government has been under a little bit of pressure to look at has been the isolation days because in America they've just cut it to five days that you need to isolate for. Um, this is following the science that transmission generally occurs one to two days before the onset of symptoms or two to three days afterwards. So it seems a bit pointless. People are saying that it's going on for 10 days. And the reason that people are thinking this should happen here is that the NHS is under great strain as it always is around this time of year, but especially um, in these days. Um, a lot of people are off in the NHS either on holiday or because they've got the virus itself so um, having staff um, you know sitting at home for 10 days when they could reasonably in the, be in the hospital helping out seems um, a bit odd um, if we just look at um, the, the effects that the the disease has had um, in football for, for instance only nine games were played on Boxing Day across all three divisions um, and 14 games are due to be played between Tuesday and Thursday this week have already been called off so it's causing havoc in just one particular um, 
place um, in society where people seem to care about, especially over Christmas. Um, hospitality obviously is being hard, hardest hit. There has been some new support from the government for this. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they welcome no new restrictions coming in because obviously hotels and restaurants um, do, do struggle when that happens. The Treasury's announced grants of up to £6,000 um, for businesses affected if they have a property. Um, but the British Chambers of Commerce are saying that that's not enough. Um, they are saying asking for more economic help, extending business rates um, and relief and the emergency rate of VAT beyond the end of March. It's yet to be seen whether that's going to happen, of course, and I think it depends on, you know, if the numbers keep going up, the government's going to come under real pressure to, to maintain its current line of, well, everyone's getting boosted, therefore, you know, we don't need to do anything. So I think early January is when we'll see if there are going to be restrictions, that's when it will happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Simon. Let's change gear now and focus on Africa's vision in 2022. Until recently, the continent had been largely sidelined from the world's multilateral institutions. But with Ethiopia's Tedros Adhanom Jebrezis steering the World Health Organization and Nigeria's Dr Ngozi Nkonjo Wela heading the World Trade Organization, the shift of global leadership to Africa provides a glimmer of hope that perhaps this greater attention will lead to greater progress. For more on this vision, I'm now being joined by Agnes Gitau, a London-based government and corporations consultant at GBS Africa, which is a business management consultancy firm. Agnes Gittel, it's always a pleasure speaking with you on Channels Business Global, particularly when we're talking about African leadership. Surprise, surprise, I think we're doing pretty well. We're holding the top jobs in lots of um, institutions across the world, the WTO, the WHO, also the IFC. Do you think we should expect more of the same coming into the new year? Look, Juliana, really good positions at global uh, institutions, but not too much to show for it back home. Look, we're still struggling with, with health access. You saw the, the crisis with vaccine, um, vaccine access for African countries. We've seen also challenges with WTO, you know, trade development and, and access to market for African countries. Yes, great position. Yet very little to show for it. I believe, as you say, going into the new year, we have an incredible position as Africa. We need to put our house in order. That's first priority. And I do understand that these leaders are not just African leaders. They are global leaders. So priority really shouldn't be the continent. But I think for us, uh, leaders back home is put our house in order, ensure that we play a strategic role, particularly going forward in trade and healthcare, which is I guess for a lot of countries will be key in 2022. Absolutely. We keep talking about this strategic role that we need to, uh, you know, start leveraging upon. It doesn't seem to have happened uh, just yet. But according to the United Nations, by 2050, a pretty scary figure, one in four people in the world will be African. Uh, that's uh, quite shocking, um, really. Um, I suppose, given what you've just said, this is a silly question to ask you, but do you think our institutions are ready uh, to leverage upon, um, you know, the human skill capacity? Juliana, another great question. 2.5 billion people will be living in the continent in 2050. That creates great opportunities for businesses, economies of scale. If you're looking for consumer market, you know, that's, the, that's where to be. However, do we have what it takes? Do, have we, do we have the right infrastructure? Do we have the right institutions? Are we preparing our, our, our people to be able to leverage on this incredible opportunity? But with opportunities comes challenges. Mm. So 2.5 billion people, most of them moving into the cities, opportunities in housing. Um, I'll give you an example. Nigeria has about 17 million houses, I mean shortages in houses per year. Kenya, where I come from, is about 2 million per year. The whole continent, 50 million. So imagine in 2050 what deficit that will be. Again, opportunities for businesses in, in affordable housing, um, but institutions must prepare because if we don't, so many people create economies of scale. These will be in my view, a disaster if you're not prepared for it. Absolutely. Preparation does need to be taking place. One of those preparations I would have thought was the recently held um, Intra-Africa Trade Fair in Durban. I know you were there in the sun enjoying yourself um, for a couple of weeks in South Africa. What were your takeaways uh, from that? Was it just more pomp and ceremony or did you actually see deals being done? Were you convinced 
and were you left with hope that actually we can get our act together and work together and prosper uh, through trade? Look, uh, just a week after the conclusion of this incredible meeting of mostly African businesses, South Africa was shut by the global community because of Omicron, because of just speaking out, playing its position as a global player, speaking out on the on the impact of, of Omicron. Anyway, back to the Inter-Africa Trade Fair, 500 deals worth $42 billion were signed in just seven days of businesses from across the world meeting together. 46 African countries were represented. 30,000 people attended the Inter-Africa uh, Trade Fair. And this is in the backdrop of um, uh, challenges of travel due to the pandemic. So this shows, Juliana, that if we put our acts together, Africans can work together. And the only way to achieve that is through trade. You know, there is no way we can move forward if we do not facilitate intra-Africa trade. Yes, so it was an incredible meeting despite the global challenges of the pandemic. And, and I was very pleased that despite the fact that, you know, it, it was held, I mean, under under really difficult situation, it was a great success. And, 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 and it was a sign uh, of the commitment of the private sector. We had about seven uh, heads of state. Uh, led by uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, Buhari, and 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 the head of the RTF, uh, former president of Nigeria, uh, president of, of Basanjo. So it was a great opportunity. Politicians, the private sector, coming together, realizing if the continent is to move ahead, we must collaborate. We must bring everybody together, and trade is the only way forward. Absolutely. Oh, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, Agnes Gitau, a government and corporations consultant at GBS Africa. Thank you, Agnes, and Happy New Year to you. Let's continue our discussion on Africa's economic vision of the coming year with a focus on trade and diaspora engagement. Before the onset of coronavirus, the six most dynamic economies in the world were African. But after almost two years of health restrictions, countries that depend mainly on oil and tourism have paid a heavy price. How can this be turned around? Let's ask Chief Bimbo roberts Falayan, the CEO of the Nigerian Diaspora Direct Investment Summit. He joins me from London. Chief Bimbo roberts Falayan, thank you so much for taking time out of your Christmas break to join me on Channels Business Global. It's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, so another day, another pledge uh, from a British minister about investment in Africa. This time it's uh, from the British Minister for Africa, Vicky Ford, who recently said in Chatham House that the UK needs to invest and build long-term partnerships on the continent. What do you envision these partnerships will look like? Um, I think that the British government needs to step up on their partnership with the uh, with Africa and particularly with Nigeria, um, not just in uh, investment, but also in the areas of uh, human rights, governance and democracy, because these are the elements that actually form uh, at the end of the day, when you talk about investment, these are the major things that affect investment. And that's what I think uh, we'll be seeing in the years going forward. Uh, there's a lot of security issues in Nigeria, particularly. A lot of uh, security issues within the uh, West African sub-region uh, with Boko Haram, with a lot of uh, kidnapping going on at, at, um, in, in West Africa. So the British government needs to step up, um, start looking at governance, start looking at how they can support uh, African countries uh, in terms of security. Without doing this, then you're giving room to uh, a lot of the destabilization that is going on in Africa right now. And also, as you can see, um, China is uh, stepping up and, you know, really, really getting ground in Africa. Before you know it, it's um, another um, a another period is uh, you know, just um, around the corner. Chief Bimbo roberts Folayan, the CEO of the Nigeria Diaspora Direct Investment Summit. Thank you so much for joining me on the show and Happy New Year to you, Chief. Coming up on Channels Business Global, I'll be speaking with Festus Akinbosoye, a British Conservative politician who was elected as Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner about the growing threat of businesses from cybercrime. Plus, I'll be looking back at some of the biggest company news stories of the week. See you after the break. 
Welcome back to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. In a few minutes, I'll be speaking with Festus Akinbosoye, but before then, here's some company news for you. London's West End saw a drop of almost half of pre-pandemic footfall levels on Boxing Day, a retail expert has said. The area, home to many of the UK's flagship retail stores, is usually bustling with shoppers hunting for a bargain after Christmas, but the footfall was 44% below 2019 levels last weekend. The West End company, which represents 600 businesses across Oxford Street, Bond Street, Regent Street and in Mayfair said this was largely due to the emergence of the Omicron variant. The latest instalment of the Spider-Man franchise has become the first pandemic-era movie to make more than $1 billion at the global box office. Spider-Man No Way Home almost took the title of highest grossing film of the year. It beat out Chinese-made Korean war epic The Battle of Lake Changjin, which has grossed more than $905 million worldwide. The last movie to gross more than $1 billion was 2019 Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, according to media data analytics firm Comscore. No other Hollywood production has come near to reaching that box office milestone since the pandemic began two years ago. A South African court has halted oil giant Shell seismic testing for oil and gas along the country's eastern coastline, pending a final ruling. The decision has been hailed by environmentalists who fear that the sound blasting will harm marine life. Shell said it had paused operations while it reviewed the judgment. South Africa's energy minister, Gwed Mantashe, has condemned the project's critics, saying they wanted to deprive Africa of energy resources. Now to our next topic. In the midst of our accelerating digital transformation, cybersecurity concerns remain one of the biggest threats to institutional economic prosperity. According to the most recent data, last year cybercrime cost the world $5.5 trillion, due in part to the exploitation of the COVID-19 pandemic by cybercriminals. The figure is the largest transfer of economic wealth in history, more profitable than the global trade in all major illegal drugs combined. Festus Akinbosoye, a British Conservative politician who was elected as Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner earlier this year, is joining me now from Organ State for more on this story. Festus Akinbosoye, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global, particularly as uh, you're on holiday in Nigeria. So I really appreciate you taking the time out to speak um, with me. Can you explain the duties of your role, both domestically back here in the UK and internationally as well? Yeah, uh, as a, a police and crime commissioner, my role is in effect to be the voice of the public when it comes to the setting of policing priorities uh, domestically. That's one part of it. And the second part of it is the working with, with the government on ensuring that my local area and police force has the, uh, the right level of resources to deliver on those policing priorities. OK, so how does that uh, manifest itself internationally? Internationally, I sit on what I, I am the co lead uh, for the um, International and Strategic Policing Portfolio Brief for all the police and crime commissioners in England and Wales. And uh, part of my role is to work with the coordination team within the National Police Chief Council uh, to ensure that when it comes to international crime, there is a, 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 a tie in between the PCCs, the police and crime commissioners, and the police chiefs nationally but also the sharing of best practices with international partners. So a lot of access to information around international financial crime, cyber crime, for example, and what is being done locally and nationally, internationally rather, to address these challenges. Oh, brilliant. So hopefully whilst you're in Nigeria, you'll be able to um, help with uh, some best uh, practice that you've picked up here. Now, violent crime, of course, remains one of the most common crimes across the world, wherever you are, whether you're in Nigeria, Northern State, or you're in Bedfordshire in England. Um, but we know that cybercrime is becoming a massive concern, particularly as we've all been working from home. Well, some of us have been fortunate enough to work from home, people adopting a digital uh, practice. How concerning is the evolution and the expansion of cybercrime? It is extremely worrying. And for any government, uh, uh, for any policymaker, and even any chief exec of a, a national or international corporation, this must be an issue. For example, um, uh, the Center for Strategic Studies found that the cost to the global economy of cybercrime 
was going to increase uh, from about $600 billion in 2017 to over a trillion dollars in uh, 2020. Now, going to what we know about cybercrime and fraud in the United Kingdom, it is one of the least reported crimes, but it accounts for about half of all reported crime. Uh, and recently, we found out that about two thirds of all internet users globally have had their data compromised and personal details, uh, you know, stolen online. And one thing we have to bear in mind is this, and I keep talking about the, the, the national security issue that cybercrime possesses, uh, sorry, pre presents to um, governments, including Nigeria and Britain and other parts of the world, is that when you start having uh, cyber criminals hacking into government databases, disclosing confidential information, you know there's a problem. And to deal with this, there needs to be a much more structured, top level coordinated activity to address this issue, especially in Nigeria as well. Absolutely, it's pretty uh, worrying. What are some of the warning signs, Festus, that businesses and financial institutions should be uh, looking out for? One thing that we found during the lockdown period, okay, is that uh, businesses, uh, employees who are working from home are being bombarded with phishing emails where they're asking for your, uh, they, they, are, they, they present as though they are on official government email and they'll be sending, asking to send, follow a link or you're getting text messages uh, asking you to click a link to go to a website that is going to be asking for conf confidential information. These are some of the things that you need to be looking for. But also when, you, when your IT systems are powering down regularly, you probably might need to be um, mindful of the fact that you're probably being attacked. Mm. So uh, one thing that we'll always encourage businesses to do, and unfortunately, I think many are still far too lax on this, is to have proper um, uh, cyber security systems in place regular audits of the systems uh there's still too much you know even even things down like passwords you know people using date of births or the name of their partners uh, as passwords you know it's very very it's very very easy to to, be, to become complacent with these things and again it's worthwhile bearing in mind that the the currency for cyber criminals is data data is the currency of cyber criminals and the moment they have access to your data, this can be sold on multiple times for huge amounts of profit with very, very low risk of being caught. So being mindful of this is a very, very important um, uh, thing to bear in mind. Thank you, uh, Festus, for that food for thought. We're running um, out of time, but I've got to ask you before I let you go, Nigerians, um, particularly those living in the UK, unfortunately, we have been, uh, you know, the butt of some jokes when it comes to keeping uh, your credit card details away from Nigerians. I think even... Uh, uh, your former uh, leader, Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, used one example. Um, but um, we do know that, um, on a serious note, uh, there are, you know, some Nigerians who are engaged in lots of illegal activity in the UK. Um, are you engaged with the community here in the diaspora? Um, and how are you encouraging them away uh, from crime? The two things I'll say about this. Um, if it is indeed true that Nigerians, you know, have, you know, uh, very, very tech savvy populations that uh, potentially use that talent for the wrong uh, purposes. And this is going to be one of the greatest amount of motivation that the Nigerian government must have to actually try to invite these people to become part of the crime fighting exercise. Because in Britain, for example, you have people who have been charged with some kind of cyber crime who are then rehabilitated to become part of the cyber crime fighting um, because they know how it works. So I would love to see the Nigerian government and the police force and the law enforcement team, for example, using this expertise that we have in Nigeria to actually fight this global pandemic uh, in, in one way. But secondly, what I will say is this, it would be very unfair to say that this is a Nigerian issue uh, because one thing that we do know is that some of the areas where you have the highest number of cyber criminals uh, attacks coming from uh, in Russia, in China, Turkey, the US, for example. And I would not want to be part of this narrative where it is Nigeria that is the cause of this. But yes, I get it. We do have some challenges. But within that, there are some opportunities, like I mentioned, that I, I would like to think the Nigerian government and the law enforcement agencies here will tap into. Oh, brilliant. Really uh, great insights from you, Festus Akimbosoye, a British Conservative a politician and um, the elected Bedfordshire Police and Crime Commissioner. Thank you so much for joining me on Channel's Business Global. Thanks, Festus.
Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week and next year for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.